Welcome to Ralph Reads, brought to you by T-U-R-N, the United Rolling Networks. My name is Paul Please like, share, comment, and subscribe to the United Rolling Networks. We are Ronin. On this edition of Ralph Reads, I continue the macabre tale written by one of the greatest writers that ever lived, Donald Goins, Dope Fiend. Without further ado, let the reading commence. Chapter 14 The snow continued to fall, bringing Terry much difficulty in her new profession. She cursed the snow, cursed Minnie, who had become a parasite, cursed Teddy, who had started her using. Again, she mentally counted the money in her bra. No matter how many times she counted it, it wouldn't get past the $15 mark until she turned another trick. She had enough to go in now and get a fix, but there was always the morning to worry about, and she had had enough of waking up sick. A red-headed teenager blew his horn at her while pulling over to park. She ran over to the car before any of the girls on the street could get to him. She jumped in beside him. Hi, honey. You looking for a girl? She asked as she quickly put her hand on his leg and rubbed his thigh. Yeah, he gulped, his face turning red. He was young, with long red hair and freckles. How much money can you spend, honey? She asked softly, her hand running up higher on his leg. Just eight dollars, he managed to say. Honey, Terry dragged the word out as though it were a caress. That ain't enough money to give no girl for making love to you. How you expect her to pay the hotel room and everything out of such a little amount of money? He hesitated for just a moment, the feel of her hand on his leg making up his mind. I got five more dollars, but I need to buy gas the rest of the week so I can go to school. She removed her hand from his leg and pretended to reach for the door. Well, if you think I ain't worth $13, I might as well find me somebody who does. Again, she reached for the door. You can't always borrow $5 from one of your friends so you can go to school. He blushed. Well, I guess I can. He removed his wallet and gave her the money. After sticking the money in her bra, she smiled. This ain't really enough for us to be going to no hotel, you know. Would you mind if we just did something in the car? He was too much out of his league to argue with her. I don't care. I just don't know where to go. Her sharp eyes had spotted two large bills in his wallet. When he opened it, she quickly made up her mind to play for it. Just pull around the corner and turn up in the nearest alley, she directed. Following her directions, he drove until he found a deserted garage and pulled up behind it. He parked and shut off the motor. Should we get in the back, he asked timidly. His hands were shaking as he tried to light a cigarette. Terry removed the cigarette from his hand and lay up against the door. Come on, honey, we ain't got all day. She squirmed down on the seat with her back against the door. With slow deliberation, she began to pull up her skirt, tantalizing him with her smooth motions. His breathing became harsh as he stretched out on the seat beside her. She loosened his pants and pushed them down around his hips. With her hand, she guided him into her while her dexterous fingers removed his wallet. While he was engrossed in the sex act, she fumbled around until she found her coat and stuck the wallet down in it. As soon as he finished, she jumped up. I'll wash up outside, she said, and leapt out the car. Once her feet hit the ground, she was running. She passed the garage flying and ran through the yard. When she reached the street, she kept going straight across until she entered another alley. Her breath was coming in gasps, but she continued running. Terry reached another street and started walking slowly, watching the traffic coming both ways. Terry! Terry! She turned to see Rico, a tall, light-complexioned dope fiend, calling her from his front porch. He beckoned for her to cross the street. She looked up and down the street closely before crossing. What's the deal, Rico? 
she yelled as she ran across the street and joined him. Hey, baby, he said. I just wanted you to know I got the bag now. If you want to cop, you can give me a little bit of that good business of yours. Her sharp, bitter laugh rang out. Honey, stuff costs too much money for me to be wasting my bread on some flea, she said flamboyantly, proud of the sting she had just taken off. This ain't no flea, Terry. I'll tell you what, if you cop and you don't like it, I'll give you your money back, he said before adding. Plus, baby, I got some dollar caps. Since she wanted to get in off the street anyway, she followed him inside the flat. She stared around in surprise when she entered. The apartment was completely vacant of furniture. The only thing in the whole living room and dining room was an old mattress. The floor was covered with cigarette butts, and around the mattress were empty red caps. God damn, Rico. I thought I was living hard, but you win hands down, she stated with honesty. Terry removed the wallet from her coat pocket and counted the money. The lying son of a bitch, she said under her breath as she removed three twenties from the wallet. Rico stared at her with interest. He had been watching her, and for a dope fiend, she was becoming one hell of a whore. What you do, baby? Take off a sting? She nodded her head in agreement as she stared around the large, empty flat. This could be one hell of a place, baby, if you fix it up. All it needs is a woman's touch, he said, dropping his hint. Terry ignored him. She removed a $10 bill from her bra. Give me 10 of them caps, Rico. Remember what you said now. If it ain't nothing but flee, I get my money back. You'll like it, he said, grinning as he pulled out his bag. He had the pills in a bottle so they would look like ordinary pills. It wouldn't fool anyone on the vice squad, although it might take in some rookies. Terry took off her coat and sat down on the floor. She began opening up the caps, dropping them into a cooker. How about getting me some clean water, honey? She asked in a husky voice. When Rico returned with the water, she had already dumped all the caps. She took the water from him, stuck her works inside the glass, and drew up some water in the dropper. She squirted the water on top of the dope inside the cooker, laid the tools down, and got out a book of matches. She held the flame under the cooker until the dope dissolved. Next, she picked up her works and drew some dope up into the dropper. You want me to hit you, Terry? Rico asked politely. She shook her head as she tied up her arm with a necktie. Don't need no help, she replied, too busy to look up. Her eyes closed as the needle slipped into her vein. Rico watched her closely. As soon as the dope took effect, he was aware of it. You like that, don't you? He asked quietly. She opened her eyes and stared at him. It ain't nothing to write home about, but it will do, she replied sharply. He waited a minute and then blurted out, Why don't you go on and choose, Terry? If we hook up, ain't no stopping us. Her laughter was harsh and cold. Hook up? Nigga, you ain't able to manage your own money. So how the fuck you think you're going to be able to manage mine? His eyes narrowed in anger. For a moment, she thought she had gone too far. He stared at her coldly for a minute. All right, you jazzy-ass bitch. When that monkey on your back gets too heavy for you to carry, remember me. Because I'll still be here, dealing and waiting for a smart-ass bitch like you to come asking for credit. Okay, big man, she said, climbing to her feet. When you get big, I'll come by and see if your offer is still open. Ain't no room in my house for no bag-chasing bitch, Terry, he answered, still angry. The only bitch I'll accept is one that chooses me while I'm down. I damn sure ain't gonna need no dope fiend whore when I get on my feet and you can bet. Big money on that. Terry walked to the door and looked back. Well, we can at least still be friends, can't we, Rico? At the last minute, she remembered that the little man with a dope bag today could be the big man with the bag tomorrow. The last thing she wanted to do was ruin something that might be beneficial to her in the near future. 
As long as we understand each other, he answered, following her to the door. The snow was now falling with such consistency that it was difficult to see farther than ten feet in front of you. Even with the snow falling, Terry kept her eyes open, making sure she didn't run into the arms of the trick she had just beat. The dope she had just shot was all right, but she was on her way to Porky's, where she could buy a quantity of dope at discount prices. Porky had never given up the hope of getting her into his bed, and she meant to keep him that way. When she came to the main street where most of the girls worked, she took her time and looked carefully around before running across. Porky sat in front of his window, looking out. He had deliberately turned his back. Minnie had been there for the past hour, begging for some credit. Her whining voice came to him sharply, piercing his ears. I done told you what you can do, bitch, he growled over his shoulder. If you want some free dope, all you got to do is put on a freak show with one of my dogs. Oh, Porky, I swear before Jesus, I'll pay you your money before this week is out. She dropped down on one knee and tugged at his shirt. Jesus, hell, bitch! Jesus ain't gonna help you! The only help you're gonna get is when you pray to Porky! Don't you understand that, bitch? He yelled, snatching his shirt loose from a grip. Please, Porky, please, I'll pray to you if it will do any good! She begged still on her knees. One of Porky's gunmen walked over and pulled her away from him, dragging her roughly across the floor. You want me to toss this bitch out the door, Porky? He asked harshly. Just a minute, Porky commanded, looking out the window. Here comes your guardian angel in disguise, running. She must be done turning a trick, cause she's sure in a hurry, Porky said, then added under his breath, the dirty bitch. Is that Terry? Minnie screamed, breaking away from the man holding her. When Terry entered, the first thing she saw was Minnie on the floor crying. Her heart went out to her pregnant friend. What's the matter, honey? Won't Porky give you no credit? You can't get none either, bitch. He growled viciously from the window. I'm tired of you dope fiends thinking I'm something soft. Minnie screamed, almost hysterically. The dirty son of a bitch wants me to fuck one of his dogs in front of everybody before he'll give me any credit. Porky laughed. I always knew you'd do it. What's wrong? You just shamed to do it in front of everybody? His diabolical laughter filled the room. You funky dope fiend bitches kill me. You try to put up your little fronts, but you don't fool me. You'd suck a shaggy bear's dick if you could get a blow out of it. He added for emphasis, every one of you is more freakish than a frog with a mustache. Terry snorted, ain't nobody in the world no more freakish than you, she said angrily. Her girlfriend pulled at her coat sleeve. Don't make him mad, Minnie pleaded. You know he just likes to have his fun. Porky roared. He sat back in his chair and laughed until tears ran down his cheeks. As quiet as it kept, Terry, he said, you can perform in the freak show with your friend. I got a dog for each one of you. You try holding your breath, Porky. Just do that until you see me put on a freak show for you. Her voice was cold. There was a harshness to it that wasn't there a month ago. She reached in her bra and pulled out her bankroll. Can I buy some dope here or has my money become funny? His eyes became hard as he stared at her. Your money is good, Terry. Just make sure you always have some. That's all. She counted out $50 and held it towards Big Ed. He took the money and counted it. She ain't got but $50, Porky. Should I let her go for that? Hell no! From now on, that bitch there has got to spend top dollar with her smart ass. Porky shouted at the top of his voice. His outbreak was enough to make Smokey come out of a deep nod and stare around, then drop her head again. 
Terry pulled out five more dollars. Is that enough? She asked, holding the money out towards Big Ed. Yeah, baby, that should handle it. He walked over and shook Smokey. When her head came up, he put the money in her lap. Like a sleepwalker, she got up and walked towards the bedroom, carrying the money in front of her. Here, honey, Smokey said as she walked over to Terry and handed her the heroin. The two women stared at each other for a moment. It's a mean, cold world, Terry. Smokey's voice was low and husky. So make sure you don't get caught out in the blizzard with nothing on but your bloomers. You might get a hell of a letdown when you find out ain't nobody there to loan you a coat. I'm beginning to learn that God blesses the child that has his own, Terry replied over her shoulder as she walked towards the door, closely followed by Minnie. When she reached the door, she stopped and stared directly at Porky. If you should catch me out in the blizzard without a coat, your best bet is to either pour water on me or watch yours real close, cause I just might end up with it. Her fading footsteps could still be heard as Porky spoke under his breath. The bitch done become a real snake. King Cobra in a female dress. Chapter 15 The courtroom sounded like a king-sized beehive as the various voices mingled, most of them speaking just above a whisper because of the strange environment. Many of the individuals sitting in the crowded court had had some experience before with courtrooms, yet because of external influences, they were still affected with an unknown dread. They continued to whisper quietly to their friends and relatives while waiting for the presiding judge to reappear. The morning was almost gone and it had been slow and repetitious. The first people to come before the judge for sentencing had been a long line of drunks, each one using a feeble excuse in an attempt to regain his freedom so he can continue his sordid life of deterioration. Teddy and Snake had long since given up their seats on the hard benches to stand in the back of the courtroom, both leaning insolently against the wall. Beside them, other young men leaned or stood posing, all of them neatly dressed, all of them waiting on the same thing. Every now and then, a fast-talking lawyer would seek out one of them in the crowd. Goddamn judges, Teddy swore angrily. We've been down here waiting over three hours, and the bastards ain't brought the whores out yet. That's part of the game, the would-be big fellows play, Snake replied. First they come out and work for an half an hour, then they go sit on their fat asses for two hours. One of the loungers in the crowd spoke up. I hear they're going to have a murder trial today, and they ain't going to bring the girls out until after the trial. Bullshit! A man farther down the line said loudly, If they was going to have a murder trial, it wouldn't be in this courtroom. Judge Sheridowski is holding court this month for all the heavy cases. Picking up prostitutes and drunks ain't nothing but another way for the judges and lawyers to keep their pockets lined with our money! He continued, now that he saw he had a listening audience. They done picked up my woman three times this month. And each time, it just costs a little more. Suddenly, a policeman came through a side door, followed by a line of well-dressed women. Most of them sported expensive wigs, and their clothes were a little too expensive for the average housewife to buy. They came in quickly, followed by another policeman with a policewoman close behind him. The men against the wall began to point out their various prostitutes, their voices extra loud to let the people sitting on the hard benches know they were pimps. As the girls marched towards an empty box seat that was sometimes used for juries on serious crimes, their eyes searched the back wall, reassuring themselves that their men wouldn't leave them in the lurch. Teddy caught Carrie's eye. There's Carrie and Shirley, Snake, he said, all the time knowing that Snake had seen them already. Their lawyer came hurrying up. I got it fixed, boys, so that your girls were just about the first ones called up. He removed a silk handkerchief from his pocket and wiped his bald head. He was a portly white man in his early 60s. His face was blotched red from too much rich food, while his chin was nothing but folds of fat. His huge belly shook as he pretended to be full of mirth. 
You boys ain't got nothing to worry about. It's all in the bag. The judge is an old friend of mine, so we haven't got any worry on that problem. He'll just give them a fine. Then you could be on your way. He rubbed his fat hands together. Now, if you fellows would just get the rest of my money together, I'll get on up there and take care of the business. It's worth it if they can get out today, Snake said, holding out a hundred dollar bill. They watched in silence as the lawyer waddled up towards the front of the courtroom and spoke to the girls. One of the men against the wall spoke up. Man, you must be crazy. That was a hundred you just gave away. You didn't need no lawyer. The judge is going to find him guilty anyway. All you had to do was wait until he found him guilty, then pay the fine. Some of the older gentlemen against the wall laughed, but the merriment ended as soon as the judge entered. Everyone in the courtroom stood up briefly, waited until the judge took his seat, then returned to his own. The judge was an elderly, distinguished-looking man with silvery white hair. His eyes were cold and bleak as he surveyed the room. When his glance came to the rest of the men standing against the wall in the back of the courtroom, sparks leapt from his pale blue eyes. He turned to stare at the women briefly. The first case he called was Shirley and Carrie. Their lawyer stood between the girls and pleaded their innocence, but the judge seemed to not even hear him. He asked the women a couple of questions, then fined them $200 apiece or six months in jail. Teddy cursed quietly. God damn, man! Them whores will be all week trying to make that money back. I ain't worried about them making it back, Teddy. What hurts is that it's part of our cop money. Snake's voice was low. That don't leave us but 300 to get over with. He continued, much dope as you and them bitches shot, we're gonna have a hard time getting our bankrolls together again. Their lawyer joined them. You boys know where to go to pay the ladies' fines, don't you? Snake pulled out his money for the price we paid you. I don't see why you don't take care of that for us. He held the money out towards the lawyer. The lawyer hesitated for just a second. Well, I don't usually do this, but for you guys, I'll take care of it. He accepted the money from Teddy. I won't be but a few minutes. You can wait out in the corridor if you want. They followed slowly behind the lawyer as he hurried out of the courtroom, aware of the sneering looks cast after them as they passed. Both men walked a little faster to get away from the leers. I feel like a goddamn fool giving that fat son of a bitch our money that way, Snake stated as they entered the hall. Well, he continued, assuming an attitude of indifference, you ain't gonna go through life playing on everybody. You get some, while others get you. It wasn't nothing but a bill, Teddy stated, trying to pretend it was really nothing. Here comes one of them now, Snake yelled, staring over Teddy's shoulder. Teddy turned and stared at Shirley as she came running up. Where the hell is your partner at? He asked, his voice gruff, full of anger. She flung her arms around Snake and kissed him. You don't know how glad I was to see you out there in the courtroom today, she said, hugging him tightly. I got bad news for you, Teddy, she stated while wiping her nose with the back of her hand. Damn, I'm getting boogie. I hope you save me a do, Snake, cause I'm sure getting sick. What kind of bad news? Teddy asked sharply. Carrie won't be getting out today, she answered flatly. Seems as if her probation officer put a hold on her. Put a hold on her? Teddy screamed. What about my $200? He was so angry, he began to shake. Well, honey, Shirley said softly, trying to pacify him. It wasn't her fault. If you hadn't paid the fine, she would have had to serve six months first. Then her probation officer would have to put a hold on her before she got out and brought her back to court for violating her paper. This way, the most time she can get is the 90 days she got left on her paper. Let's get the fuck out of here, Snake said as Teddy continued to grumble. It ain't gonna help none, us standing around hoping we might be able to get her out. That's right, Shirley agreed quickly. She said she'd call you, Teddy, as soon as she found out what they was going to do to her. So we might as well get home so you can catch a call. They walked out of the court building with Teddy following slowly behind them. It was a clear day, but the wind was blowing off the river, causing everyone to shake from the chill.
I sure am glad to get outside. Damn, I almost forgot how nice it was to be out, Shirley stated, pulling her coat up around her neck. Nice hell, I don't see a motherfucking thing nice about it, Teddy growled as he caught up with them. Snake grinned to himself and kept on walking. He was used to hearing his partner bitch about something or another. Since you ain't got Carrie no more, Teddy, Snake said, you might as well try and cop Terry back. They tell me she done become one hell of a whore. I don't need no whore, Teddy replied arrogantly. That goddamn Carrie done shot up more dope than she'll ever be able to pay for if I kept her here. Shirley stuck her arm through snakes. Come on, honey. Let's hurry, please. My nose is running. Plus, I'm starting to get the flashes. They finally reached the parking lot where they had left the car. After Snake paid the parking lot attendant, they all piled in, huddled together for warmth. Shirley's teeth began to rattle. Damn, I don't know why I keep on using. I ain't got no blood left in my veins. It ain't no sense in nobody getting this cold just walking a few feet. Man, cut that damn cold-ass heater off, Teddy yelled when a blast of cold air hit him. I suppose you're getting sick too, Snake asked sarcastically as he drove out of the parking lot. The drive back across town to their apartment was swift. Traffic was at a minimum. It was still early in the day. Snake parked and the three of them hurried toward the apartment, all driven by the same desire. As soon as Teddy put his key in the lock and pushed open the door, Snake and Shirley rushed past him. Everybody made a beeline to where they had stashed their personal works. This is the last of the bag, Teddy, Snake stated as he came back from the bedroom carrying a small amount of dope on an album cover. How much you think we got there? Teddy asked curiously. It don't look like it's enough for all three of us. Shit, Shirley exclaimed. Both of you done already had a fix. You should at least give me that so I could get myself together. Teddy laughed harshly. You'll never get yourself together if you're depending on shooting my stuff up. Maybe your man might feel like he don't need no stuff, but I sure need mine. Without bothering to look up, Snake continued to split up the small amount of dope. He made three small piles. Here's yours, Shirley, he said, pushing a pile of dope toward her. And that one there is yours, Teddy. He pointed at the pile of heroin left on the album as he pushed his own share into a cooker. How come when you split the dope up, Snake, you don't let me pick the pile I want? Teddy asked indignantly. Without seeming to hear Teddy's complaint, Snake continued to cook up his dope. Shirley quickly snorted up part of her dope. You are beyond a doubt the most crying little bastard I've ever seen, Teddy, she said between snorts. If you ain't bitching about one thing, it's something else. Her voice became lower as she dragged her words out now. The heroin was quickly taking effect. Take care of your own business, bitch, Teddy answered, holding a tie between his teeth as he felt for a vein. Why don't you check your whore, Snake? The bitch ain't got no business in my conversation. Snake sat back in his chair and jacked the works off in his arm. He would let the dropper fill up with blood, then run it back into his vein. That shit both of y'all talking about ain't nothing. Give me some of that dope you got on that paper, Shirley, he asked. She bent down and snorted up the rest of the dope. I ain't got none left. Greedy ass bitch, that's all you is, Shirley, Teddy stated emphatically. That's all you and your girlfriend is, is two walking vipers, two dope fiend ass bitches, greedy bitches at that. Honey, you gonna let him talk to me like that, she asked Snake. Her head dropped down on the chest as she nodded. Before Snake could answer, someone knocked on the door. Make yourself needed, baby, Teddy said. Try answering the door. Shirley got up and walked toward the door, moving with a swaying motion. She was tall, with graceful legs, long-limbed. The mini-dress she wore revealed her large, well-formed thighs. She opened the door without bothering to look. Four men rushed through the door. Teddy looked up from his cooker, and his heart lurched with fear. He knew only one of the men. The three that he didn't know spread out around the room. Snake must have felt a similar fear. He stood up and shouted, What the fuck is going on here? He stared around the room at the four men. 
One of them pushed Shirley towards the middle of the room, while another opened the bedroom and stared inside. Three of the men displayed pistols. Shirley started to cry loudly. It had never occurred to Teddy that they might get stuck up. He had relied on Snake's reputation for being bad. Now, as he looked from one face to the other, he could feel his bowels about to move. His stomach shook as if he had a vibrator machine around his waist. Snake's handsome face was drawn tight with anger. Just what the fuck do you think you're doing? He asked harshly. One of the gunmen, his pistol already half cocked, stepped forward and swung the gun against Snake's head. Immediately, a loud shot filled the room. The gunman jumped back surprised as Snake fell to the floor. He stood staring down at Snake, shaking, his face filled with fear. Two of his partners knelt beside the body. My God, one of the men exclaimed, you done killed him. All of the men became excited now, fear showing on all of their faces. You, one of them said, pointing his gun straight at Teddy, put all of the money and dope on the table. Don't get smart or you end up on the floor with Snake. Teddy hurriedly dumped all of the money out of his pocket on the table. We ain't got no stuff, man. We was just getting ready to make up. The same man who had spoken to him hit him upside the head with the barrel of his gun. Nigga, we ain't got no time for lying. I'm gonna ask you one more time. Where is that dope? Teddy sprawled out on the floor, climbed to his knees. Blood ran down the side of his face from the blow and tears of fear mingled with the blood. He blubbered as he tried to speak. He pointed his finger at Shirley. Ask her if you think I'm lying. She knows. We just split the last stuff in the house and shot it up. The gunman kicked him viciously in the face. I ain't joking with you, nigga. I want that dope. Shirley hastily fell to her knees. She realized that if they killed Teddy, they would kill her so that there would be no witnesses. Please, mister, please. He's telling the truth. Snake got the rest of the cop money in his pocket. They just got me out of jail and we was on our way to cop after doing up. The gunmen stared at each other uneasily as one of them went through Snake's pocket. Here's the rest of the money, the searcher said. Who you cop from? One of them growled. Maybe we can go take him off. Porky, Teddy answered quickly. We cop from Porky over on Darwin Street. Two of the men cursed. We can forget about that then, one of them said as he backed toward the door. The one who had done the shooting regained his courage. What are we gonna do about them? We can't just walk off and leave them. You ain't about to get me mixed up in no mass killing, another one replied as he backed toward the door. The rest of them followed suit and soon no one was left but Shirley and Teddy. They stared at the body in terror. What we gonna do? Shirley asked in a trembling voice. We got to get the hell out of here before they come back, Teddy stammered. Then we got to notify the police. They left the apartment together, clinging to each other for courage. After calling the police, they sat out in the car and waited for their arrival. The cut on the side of Teddy's head turned out to be only slight, but his lips were puffed out from the force of the kick. After the police arrived, they sent Teddy to the hospital to get some stitches in his lip and took Shirley to the station to get a full report. Later in the evening, they got together again. Teddy still had Snake's car, so he dropped Shirley off at work. The excitement of the day was over. Now they both had to take care of their immediate problem. It was time for them to get up some money. They both needed a fix. Chapter 16 the night had passed slowly for Teddy since Snake's death. Not because of any deep concern he had for Snake, but because of Snake's woman. Shirley had promised to meet him after work in the morning so they could go and cop together. He had watched closely for her since he hadn't made any money. Now with daylight shining through the restaurant window, he forced himself to accept the fact that she wasn't coming. At least he reasoned with himself he had gained something from the ordeal. 
He had Snake's car. He wasn't about to give it up to none of Snake's kin. He stared at the waitress angrily until she turned her head. His nose had started to run, and he didn't want to hear no shit. He had been sitting in the restaurant since midnight. It was now going on 8 o'clock in the morning. The day shift waitress came on duty, and the two women talked in a hushed tone, every now and then glancing up to see if he was watching. Someone came in the door. He looked up hopefully. It was just another one of the girls who had been working the streets all night, coming in for breakfast. Hi, Teddy, she said, sitting down beside him. Didn't you say earlier you was looking for Shirley? She went on before he could answer. I saw her get in Pee Wee's Cadillac. From the way they've been talking, I think they went to the west side of cop. Teddy felt his stomach sink. How about loaning me five dollars, B? I'll give it back to you as soon as I get my bag together. No bet, baby, she said, getting up. If my man heard about me loaning you some money, he'd kill me. She walked over to the jukebox and played some records, then sat down at a table by herself. A sigh of despair escaped from Teddy. He knew now he was right back where he started from. Only this time, he had transportation. He got up and walked slowly toward the door. He had already gotten a blow from Porky after telling him the news, so he knew his credit wasn't any good. He felt in his pocket it hadn't grown any money since the last time he reached in there. He still had about 50 cents worth of change. He decided to put that in the gas tank. He drove up and down the street slowly, looking for Terry. If he could find her, he thought, he'd take whatever money she had made. Unable to find her, he pulled up in a gas station and spent his last 50 cents. While he was there, he opened the trunk and noticed a spare. He ended up pawning the spare tire and jack for five dollars. He rushed over to Porky's house and spent it. It just barely knocked the chills off, so he was back where he started, minus one tire and jack. His mind started working feverishly. Today was check day. If he could cut off the mailman, he could get his sister's check and cash it at the neighborhood grocery store. As he jumped in the car and raced toward his old neighborhood, he promised himself that as soon as he turned the dope bag over, he would return his sister's money. If I move fast, he thought, I'll have her money back no later than tonight. It was still early when he parked a few doors away from his mother's house. He cut the motor off and sat watching the street. After about an hour, he saw the mailman turn into his block. He started the car and drove slowly toward the man. Hi there, he yelled out the window. You got a minute? The mailman walked slowly toward the car, a handful of letters gripped tightly in his left hand. Hi, Teddy. What are you doing up so early? I always thought you was a late sleeper. I got to take Bessie to do some shopping, Al. He answered, she asked me to pick up her check from you so that we could be on our way. Before the mailman could reply, he continued, she's getting dressed and figured if I could get the check from you and cash it, we could save some time. For a moment, the mailman was undecided. I don't like to give out other people's checks, Teddy, but since she is your sister, I guess it's all right this time. His words were like a stimulant for Teddy. He couldn't believe his good luck. He held his breath while the mailman looked through the mail. Finally, he found a long envelope and held it out toward Teddy. Bessie had grown tired of waiting for the mailman to show up with her check. She grabbed her coat and stepped out on the porch. I'll be back shortly, Mama, she yelled at her mother as she went out the door. I just want to see if the mailman's coming. She stepped out on the sidewalk and stopped. Damn, if that don't look like Teddy, she thought as she put her hand up, shading her eyes from the glare of the sun. She saw the mailman hand him something, and her heart leapt. It couldn't be, she told herself as she started running in that direction. She watched Teddy as he climbed back in the car and drove off. Tears ran down her cheeks as she tried to run faster. Before she reached the mailman, she started yelling, He didn't get my check, did he? You didn't give him my check, did you? Her voice sounded shrill in the still morning air. The mailman stopped and stared stupidly. He had heard her, yet the words didn't seem to make any sense. She finally reached him. She clutched at his arm. He didn't get my check, did he? She asked breathlessly. The wind blew hair in her face, covering some of the tears running down her cheeks. The mailman nodded his head up and down, too shocked to speak, wondering what he had gotten himself into. Already, he was thinking what he could say to his supervisor to explain this mess. 
Suddenly, a police car turned the corner and came slowly down the street. Bessie ran out into the street and blocked its path. Before it could stop, she ran around the car and began talking. Just a little slower, ma'am, the driver said. His partner opened the door for her to get in. The mailman came over and explained what had happened, then pointed out the direction Teddy had taken. I don't know what we can do other than make out a report, miss. He's probably long gone by now, the driver said in a bored voice. If you hurry, we can stop him, she blurted. He's got to cash it, and I don't think he knows but one store to cash it at. You know where that's at? The driver asked quickly, the excitement of an arrest instantly replacing any feelings of boredom. Turn the car around. As she gave directions, in a matter of minutes, they were parking behind Teddy's car. He was leaning over the counter, writing on the back of the check, when Bessie and the two policemen walked in. At their approach, he wheeled around. Fear instantly flashed across his face. He could feel his stomach lurching, and his knees began to tremble. As his sister snatched the check from him, he turned his face away so she wouldn't see his shame. How could you, Teddy? How could you, she asked angrily. You know damn well we need his money to feed the family with. Whether it's mine or not, you know mama needs a part of it for the rent. As they led him away, the driver spoke to her. You have to come downtown to the station with us, miss, and file a formal complaint. Since it's your brother, you better talk to the sergeant. In the back seat of the police car, on the way to the station, Teddy pleaded, Bessie, I was going to bring you your money back tonight. Really, baby, don't do this to me. I'm your brother, honey. I know you don't mean to do this to me, girl. You're just mad right about now. But if you stop and think about it, you'll change your mind. She shook her head stubbornly. I don't care what you say, Teddy. I ain't going to change my mind. I'm doing it for you, man. If you continue shooting that dope, you're going to end up dead. At the mention of drugs, both policemen became alert, but neither spoke, fearing she might change her mind. At the station, they quickly fingerprinted Teddy while Bessie filed a complaint. She took time out to call her mother and tell her what had happened. After she hung up the phone, there were tears in her eyes, but she didn't change her mind. Teddy watched Bessie leave through the front door. Fear was a large ball in his throat. After leaving all of his personal belongings with the desk sergeant, he followed the turnkey up the stairs. The turnkey stopped in front of a large steel door with a small barred window across it. He opened it with his key and shoved Teddy inside. Once inside, Teddy stopped and stared around. It was a large room with two iron benches in it. Stretched out on the benches in various positions were four men. All were slovenly in their attire, and their hair was disheveled from trying to sleep on the iron benches and floor. In one corner of the large cell, a toilet gave off a vile odor of stale piss. One of the men got up from the bench and stretched out on the floor. You can lay there, man, he said. Goddamn floor is softer than them goddamn benches. Teddy took off his overcoat and put it under high head. He stretched out on the bench with one cold, chilling thought racing through his mind. How can I get out before I get sick? The rest of the day passed slowly for the five men. Every now and then, one of them would get up and pace up and down. Just as quickly, he would get tired and sit back down on the hard bench. They had each revealed to Teddy what they were in jail for. Now, with the coming of night, there was not too much more to say. Each man stared out into the empty space alone with his fears and private thoughts. When the midnight crew of turnkeys came on duty, Teddy got up and pressed his face to the bars. Turnkey! Turnkey! He yelled over and over. What you want back there? One of the guards yelled back. The young guard walked up and stared through the bars at Teddy. What you want, boy? He asked in a harsh voice. I try to tell the other turnkeys, man. I'm a dope fiend. I got to have some kind of medicine. How about sending me over to the hospital? The guards loud, brutal laughter filled the cell. Well, what do you know about that? We got another dope fiend! You should have thought about that, boy, before you got put in here. The only thing you'll get from us is a kick in the ass if you keep yelling. You might as well make up your mind to kick cold turkey, because we ain't got nothing for you. Nothing, you understand that, boy? Nothing! 
Teddy listened to the sound of his footsteps as he walked away. The other men inside the cell watched Teddy silently, feeling sorry for him, yet too aware of the facts of life to intrude on his privacy, knowing there was nothing they could do for him. It was his problem. They had witnessed many addicts come and go, all of them fighting their problem in different ways, some silently, others climbing the walls. If he got too sick, the police would come in and take him out and toss him in a cell by himself, probably further down the rock, where they wouldn't be disturbed by his outcries. As the night dwindled on, it became a nightmare for Teddy. He was past the stage of just being bothered by his nose running. Hot and cold flashes shot through him. He climbed off the bench and lay on the floor. His skin began to feel as though insects were crawling under it. He twisted and turned on the hard concrete. He pulled his legs up tight and tried to sleep in the ball. Soon that position became unbearable, and he moaned and cried out loud, shattering the silence of the night. Every now and then, one of the other men would mutter encouragement. Fight it, boy. You'll be all right. Just don't give in. You're bigger than any old monkey. When daylight came, his clothes were soaking wet and his hair was stringy. His face was filled with shock. He had looked into the pits of hell. The thought of at least two more days of this terrified him beyond all reason. His only thoughts were of dull. He had gotten up and searched his pockets frantically after dreaming during a catnap that he had some dope in his pocket. You all right, Teddy? One of the men asked, his voice expressing real concern. You might be able to get some kind of aspirin from the crew coming on now. Teddy climbed to his feet and stumbled over to the commode. He vomited until nothing more would come up. Green slime clung to his chin as he continued to dry heave. It was later in the day when a turnkey came and called his name. He staggered to his feet and stepped over the food trays as the officer opened the door. You got a visit, son, the elderly turnkey said, compassion in his voice. He had been working on this same floor for over ten years, and he had seen the addicts come and go. He had come to realize that when a real dope fiend came in off the streets, it was a pitiful sight. He led Teddy down the corridor, opening and locking doors behind them. The turnkey stopped in front of a small cell with bars covered with a thin screen, the wires so intricately woven together that a cigarette couldn't be shoved through the tiny holes. The officer closed the door behind Teddy and stood outside. From a distance, Teddy could hear his mother's voice. Suddenly, she was standing before him, his sister beside her, staring at her son in horror. There was a small patch on the side of his head from where he had been hit with the pistol. At one time, it had been white, but since sleeping on the filthy floor, it was black. His bottom lip was stitched up and his hair full of debris. He clutched the bars and sank to his knees. Mama, please, Mama, help me, he cried. Tears ran down his cheeks and mingled with the dirt. Her hands flew to her heart, and her dark face twisted with despair and agony. Son! Son! Her voice was feeble with anguish. What you trying to do to me? I could feel it in my soul, Teddy. You killing me, child. There was naked despair in her eyes as she tried to reach out and take her son in her arms. Please, Bessie, please, she cried from her knees. We can't leave my son in here. She stared up at her daughter, tears of pain running down her face. Bessie pulled at her mother's arms. Mama, Mama, get up, please. You're going to be all right. It won't kill him. She tried to pull her mother to her feet. Her mother shook her head stubbornly. Dear God, Jesus, I'd rather see him dead than in here like this. I can't stand it, Jesus. I can't stand it. I just can't stand it. Her voice shook with her grief. She climbed off her knees, a large woman who knew nothing but how to get in the kitchen and make the pots ring. Her sole happiness lay in seeing her children happy. A woman who has spent a lifetime raising her children, working from sunup to sundown, never spending her small amount of money on herself, always on her children. She staggered toward the turnkey. Officer! 
Officer, please, sir, let my boy go. She reached out for his arm. He won't do nothing no more. Just please let me take him home this time. She would have fallen to her knees in front of him, but he held her arms. He stared past her shoulder at Teddy. He had to admit it was a sorrowful sight. The boy looked like someone had beaten the hell out of him. I can't do nothing, lady. It's up to the detectives. You'll have to talk to them. Bessie stared at her brother clinging to the bars. I swear to God, Teddy, you're the sorriest excuse for a man I've ever seen. She walked over and put her arms around her mother's shoulders. Mama, Mama, don't carry on like that. He just ain't worth it. Her mother turned and stared at her. There was anger in the tear-filled eyes. Don't tell me what my child ain't worth, Bessie. You hear? Just don't do that. I had him just like I had you. You too is all I got in this world next to your children, so don't tell me he ain't no good. What you want me to do, Mama? She asked in a subdued voice. You got him here, Bessie. Now you get him out. She walked over to the bars. I don't care what you done did, boy. You're mine, and I'm going to do all I can to help you. Teddy got up off his knees. He was feeling better already. Just the thought of getting out was like a burst of sunshine on a cloudy day. Bessie walked up to the bars. I ain't said nothing about getting you out, Teddy, she said without conviction. Mama, he needs to be here for a while, she said, trying to reach her mother, hoping to make her understand. Mama, he's a dope addict. It ain't no way for him to help himself unless he stays in here and kicks the habit. Her mother began to plead. Bessie, I'm asking you, child, to get your brother out of here. Her voice became firmer. If you won't do what I ask you, Bessie, I'm going out of here and go to the bank and get that money I've been saving and get him a lawyer to get him out. It's up to you. You can't do that, Mama. You've been saving that money for two years so you could get you another stove, Bessie said, still trying to use reason. Stove don't mean nothing to me, child. I want my boy out of here if it takes the last penny I got in this world. Bessie shrugged her shoulders and turned to the turnkey. I guess I better see the detectives. Could you show me where they're at? You'll have to wait until I lock him back up. Then I'll come back and show you the way, he answered. He led the women toward the elevator, then returned and took Teddy back to his cell. Teddy paced back and forth in the large cell. The monkey seemed to sense that relief was coming. His legs continued to ache while flashes of chills raked his body, but he managed to suppress most of the pain. His mind was fever-ridden. All he could think of was where to get a fix. He tried to sell his shoes to one of the inmates, but the man only laughed. You gonna need them, boy. It's snowing outside, one of the other prisoners said. Each time he heard a turnkey coming down the hall, rattling keys, he rushed to the door and stood there shaking. After what seemed like an eternity, he heard someone unlocking the door. The guard called his name. I'll be seeing you guys, he yelled as the guard told him to bring all his belongings. The prisoners watched him leave, torn between wishing it was one of them leaving and being glad to see him go. One of the men stood with his face pressed against the bars until Teddy was out of sight. Well, there he goes, he says. I wonder how long it would be before he's back again. The turnkey pushed all of Teddy's belongings across the desk to him. Well, your sister dropped the charges, so you're free to go. Your mother's waiting downstairs for you. You can take the elevator down if you want to. Teddy glanced at the stairway. Don't the stairs lead down there? No, the guard answered shortly. They lead to a side entrance, as you probably already know. He watched coldly as Teddy headed for the stairway. He slowly picked up the phone. I might as well save that poor woman a long wait, he reasoned. The desk sergeant cursed under his breath as he hung up the phone. It was to a bewildered, broken-hearted old woman that he told the news. Chapter 17 
The snow continued to fall in a steady pattern. Minnie stamped her feet in the doorway in an attempt to start some circulation. She rubbed her cheeks roughly, trying to bring back some warmth. When these attempts failed, she left the doorway and stepped out from the shelter into the chilling wind. She stared at the traffic passing slowly by. Idly, she glanced across the street at the east side cleaner's clock in the window. It was ten minutes to twelve. Damn, she cursed under her breath. Here it was nearly noon, and she still hadn't caught a trick. As she wrapped her arms around the thin winter coat she wore, she began counting up the hours she had been working without breaking luck. Since 10 o'clock last night, she remembered angrily over 14 hours of walking back and forth on this corner without any luck. She stopped and leaned up against Stephen's pawn shop window. She could feel the baby kicking inside of her, but it didn't bring her any joy. She cursed the snow, the cold, and the baby. Her junky sickness had been coming down on her gradually at first, but now the slumbering monster was awakening, taking complete control of her consciousness. She stared through the window at the radios, wondering if she could break the window and grab one and run. She shook her head and walked on down the street. It was becoming apparent that she would have to get some money from somewhere before she did something desperate. For a moment, she toyed with the idea of going back to the hotel and waking up Terry again, but quickly gave up the idea. Terry had cursed at her through the door earlier that morning when she had awakened her. It had been a slow night for Terry, too. After making enough of her fix, she had gone in, getting away from the freezing cold. Minnie stopped in front of Ned's supermarket and stared through the window. She watched the old white couple behind the counter as the wife waited on two children. She gave up the idea of going in because there was nothing out on the counters worth stealing. A sharp pain shot up from her stomach, causing her to bend over. She waited until it had passed, trying to make up her mind stronger than the pain. From the dilapidated doorways, other prostitutes watched Minnie from hooded eyes. Some of them had the same problem. Their monkey was hungry this morning, too. Others had a problem, but it wasn't a habit. It was the headache of trying to satisfy a money-hungry pimp. A pimp could be cruel, Minnie thought, but the most vicious pimp could never arouse the fear and pain an expensive dope habit brought on. A woman passed, leading two little children. She stared at Minnie angrily, as though Minnie had personally done something to her, and pulled her little girls out of Minnie's reach. Both children were dressed neatly in matching snowsuits. Minnie stared after the children. They brought back memories of her childhood. Only there were no cute snowsuits that she could recall. It had always been cold, as she remembered it. Even then, she wore a thin fall coat she had to make use of in the coldest of weather. Snow boots had been a dream of hers for years when she was a child. She hadn't owned a pair until after her 13th birthday, and then only because she had been able to steal them from the girls' lockers at school. She watched a drunk stagger down the street toward her. Before she could reach him, two other girls bore down on him from out of the darkened doorway. She ran up to the crowd, ignoring the angry stares the other two women cast at her. The two women were holding the drunk up, each one holding an arm. Minnie walked straight up to him. As the wind whipped his coat back, she put her arms around his waist, rubbing her huge belly against the negro's trick stomach. He tried to focus his fire-red beady eyes on her, but before he could even see who was hugging him, her dexterous fingers went to work. She plucked his wallet out before the other girls became aware of what she was doing. They didn't know what was happening until she released him and took off down the street. Their shouts of anger followed her as she tried to run, her huge belly bouncing up and down. The colored drunk turned around as the women released him and stared after her. He could have still caught her, but he was the only one on the street who didn't realize what had happened. She had dipped so neatly that he hadn't felt a thing. Minnie turned the corner and kept on running. Her breathing became hard, and she had to swallow her spit. She opened and closed her mouth as though she were a fish out of water. Her hand clutched at her side, but she continued to run. When she reached the hotel, she glanced back over her shoulder before turning in. She ran up the steps and stopped inside the doorway. When she saw the caretaker staring out of her door at her, she went on up the stairs toward Terry's room. She wasn't in any mood to be bothered about back rent. 
She prayed that the wallet held enough money so she wouldn't have to go back out in the streets for at least two days. Maybe even enough money so she could pay up on her rent. Her fingers trembled as she began to open the wallet. She peered inside, slowly. Suddenly her fingers started to search wildly. She stopped and stared, then slowly removed two dollars from it. It felt as if the world was coming to an end. Disappointment ate at her. Her eyes filled with tears. She began to weep, slowly at first, then louder and with complete despair. Frantically, she snatched the rest of the papers out of the wallet and tossed them on the floor. Using her foot, she scattered them over the hallway, then stumbled down the hall into Terry's room. She pounded on the door, weeping and crying out, Terry! Terry! Open the door, Terry! Inside the room, Terry lay on her back, staring at the ceiling. She listened to Minnie's pounding. It seemed to be coming from a long way away. Her eyes canned the dresser first, making sure her dope was out of sight, before climbing out of the bed and making her way to the door. Her long black hair fell down across her shoulders, and she took her hand and tossed it out of her face. She was still very attractive, yet her eyes were beginning to show the strain of constant using. What you want, girl? A person ain't able to get no sleep in this goddamn hotel for your ass? Don't you never get tired of beating on my fucking door? Her words were hard, but her voice was low and without malice as she opened the door. I just beat a trick for his wallet, Terry, and wasn't nothing in it but two dollars, Minnie managed to say, fighting to regain her breath. Her words came out in a rush, but they were so mixed up with her sobs that for a moment, Terry couldn't understand her. Minnie leaned her back against the door, still trying to regain her breath. Is that all you woke me up for? Terry asked, unable to hide her rising anger. You could have at least waited until I got up. You know damn well I worked all night, and I'd just come in a few hours ago. Her voice was sharp from the lack of sleep. Minnie fumbled in her pockets until she found the two dollars she had stolen. He didn't have but two dollars in his wallet, Terry. So I come up here. I thought if he had a fat wallet, I'd buy us both a blow this morning. She waited, staring at Terry's face. That's the real reason I came, honey. I thought I made a big sting, but I didn't open the wallet until I got outside your place. So after I found out there wasn't no money in it, I come in anyway. Terry looked up quickly. She knew what this was leading up to. Well, I could have used a tooth this morning because I sure didn't make any money last night. She looked away, not wanting to see the disappointment that spread over Minnie's face. She tried to make her heart cold. There was really nothing she could do for Minnie this morning. Her money was short. Minnie could feel her stomach lurching. There was despair in her voice as she asked, I don't need but three dollars more, Terry. Then I could get a blow and get my sickness off. Ain't nothing I could do about it, Terry stated, her face assuming the expression of a ruthless dope fiend, lips turning downward in a cruel, unyielding line. I ain't got but ten dollars left, baby, and I need that for when I get up. There was desperation in Minnie's eyes as she walked over to the bed and clutched at Terry's arm. Why don't you loan me half of that, Terry? I'll make it back before you get up. Terry shook her arm free and drew back. No good. She yelled and shook her head. I ain't buying that shit. When I wake up, I'm going to be sick. And five dollars ain't going to get my sickness off. You've been out working since last night, girl, and you ain't make but two dollars? How you think you're going to make any money in the next two hours if you didn't make any all night and morning? Minnie stared down at her girlfriend, too sick to argue. For a full minute, she thought about the knife in her coat pocket. It wouldn't be hard to pull it out and make Terry give up the money. She was tempted to try, but rejected the idea. Ten dollars wouldn't get but one fix. And then she would have blown Terry's friendship. In that light, she decided to pass it up. Sometimes when Terry took off a good trick, she would find her and give her a blow. With that in mind, she turned and staggered from the room. Terry watched her go with mixed feelings. As soon as the door closed, Terry ran over and locked it. She then walked to the dresser and removed a small package from a drawer. She opened up the small pack of dope. There was just enough left in the package to make up two more hits. 
Her conscience disturbed her for a moment. She could have given Minnie a blow and still have enough to wake up on. She also had $10 worth of cash left, but she always kept $10 for don't go money. Terry took her time fixing up. The thought ran through her mind, just before sticking the needle in, that she could still run out and catch her friend. She pumped the dope into her vein. The drug hit immediately. She lay back on the bed and went into a deep nod, the spike still dangling from her arm. Minnie made her way out of the hotel and headed straight for Porky's. She made herself believe that Porky would feel sorry for her and give her some credit. Pighead led her in the apartment. God damn, that stomach of yours is sticking out a fucking mile, he said as she came in the door. I bet that box is hot as an oven, Porky said from his large chair. He crossed his huge legs and the blood-red bathrobe he wore slipped open. Minnie made her way over to Porky. I ain't got but two dollars, she said, and held the money out to him. Porky moved forward and ran his hand under her dress. Girl, how can you stand working out there in all that cold weather without any pants on is beyond me, he said, still feeling under her dress. She opened her legs wider and stood wide-legged. I'm sorry, Porky. You gonna help me? There was much more than just begging in her voice. There was the sound of total despair. He removed his hand from under her dress and stared into her face. It was all there for him to see. Will you listen to that, Ed? He exclaimed loudly. If I remember correctly, this was one of those smart-ass bitches that talked plenty shit a few months ago. There wasn't none of me, she answered quickly, then tried to shift the blame. You know that's Terry, who always talks smart to you, Porky, not me. All you dope fiends are the same, Porky stated brutally. You ain't got no respect for nobody. Terry been taking care of your habit most of this winter, yet here you are, ready to sell her out for a fix. A small gleam came into his eyes as he stared up at her. He stood up. Come on, he ordered and walked towards the bedroom, never looking back to see if she would follow or not. He knew she was coming. Her sickness had her in such a way that anything went, no matter what, if she could get a fix out of it. Minnie followed him into the room and closed the door after Smokey walked past. Take your clothes off, Porky demanded. He watched her closely as she undressed. Minnie had reached a point where she no longer thought, only reacted. She moved now as though she were a robot. She removed her clothes quickly and stood before him naked. Porky led her to the bed, pushed her over. He spread her legs wide, then using his fingers, he toyed with her for a while. First, he experimented to see how many of his fingers he could stick up her at one time. Growing tired of this, he tried inserting his huge fist. Next, he got up and released one of his large German police dogs. He brought the dog back to the bed and lifted him up between her legs. Suddenly, Minnie realized what was about to happen to her. She twisted her head into the pillow. Scalding tears ran down her cheeks as she felt the dog's paws against her stomach. Animal sounds came to her, and she shut her eyes tightly, not wanting to know whether they came from Porky or the dog. She could feel Porky twisting her hair, and without opening her eyes, she opened her mouth to accept the rigid penis he was sticking in her face. Later, Porky shoved her out of the bed. Go in there and wash up, he commanded. She got up and obeyed, moving as if in a dream. When she returned from the bathroom, he tossed two small $10 packs at her. Take it across to your place and do it, he ordered. I don't want to see your freakish ass for a while. She staggered back through the living room in a daze. Big Ed stared at her curiously as he led her out the door. It was not the first time he had seen a woman come out of Porky's room looking as though she had peeped into the bottomless pit of hell. Some, like Minnie, looked as though Porky had taken away their very souls, leaving only shell. Minnie made her way across the street and into her room, not really knowing how she got there. 
The dope was still clutched tightly in her hand. She stared at it curiously for a second, then got up and dumped it all in the cooker. After she worked, without thought, her mind drifted back through the past. Life had always been difficult. Since her early childhood, things had always worked out harshly for her. She thought about the coming problem of raising a child. Tears ran down her cheeks as she saw what kind of life she would have to offer her baby. She struck two matches and lit up the bottom of the cooker. She had done this so many times that she could do it with her eyes closed. Her mind continued to drift as she cooked up the dope. The thought of her child coming into the world as a dope fiend saddened her. If she had only committed herself, things would have been different. Suddenly the lighted matches burned her fingers. The pain made her release the matches and the cooker. Dope spattered all over as the cooker took a bounce when it hit the varnished floor. She stared down at the spreading puddle of heroin. It had been all for nothing, she thought. Her mind began to play tricks on her. What had been for nothing? What had been for nothing? For a moment, she couldn't remember anything. Then she remembered one of her drunken mother's boyfriends getting into bed with her one morning when she was a child. The pain, her mother's anger directed more at her than at the man. Later that morning, she had prayed to die while lying in the bed. When she awoke, she had been hurt and angry that her prayer hadn't been answered. Without hesitation, she began to pull the dresser into the middle of the floor. When she got it in place, she got the only chair in the room and climbed up on it and cut down a clothing line. Now she moved with calm deliberation. She was doing something she had thought about on many occasions. How many times had she lain in this very room, sick, knowing there was a way around her problem? The idea of not waking up sick anymore brought a slight smile to her lips. She undressed slowly, removing all her clothing. She hesitated briefly, wondering if she should wash, but the thought flashed through her mind that no amount of water would ever get her clean again. Then she remembered the dog and Porky. Tears started flowing down her wrinkled brown cheeks. She reached up toward the ceiling and grabbed the chain the light bulb hung from. She removed the light bulb and placed her clothesline around the chain. She twisted the rope together so that it wouldn't bust from her weight. She tied a sliding knot in the rope and put it around her neck. When she thought everything was ready, she stepped off the chair. Her legs kicked viciously, reaching out for some support, but she had kicked over the chair. The shadow on the wall revealed a grotesque dance of despair, an ending of horror, the beginning of peace. This concludes this part of the miniseries on Ralph Reed's. I would like to thank you, queens and kings, fellow royalty, for stopping by. You can connect with me via Twitter and Instagram, as well as Periscope, at RGMC2407. Drop me an email over to RGMC2407 at gmail.com. If you would like to leave a small donation, you may do so at paypal.me forward slash RGMC2407 or the Cash App. My cash tag is RGMC2407. You may also find me on my very own channel, RGMC. Ralph Garcia, Master of Ceremonies, as well as right here at home on the United Ronin Networks. We are Ronin. Fellow royalty, pick up a good book, read a good story, and set your good self free. I appreciate you, and I love you like cooked food. I will see you folks on the next edition of Ralph Reed's Alphita Sin.